Okay, welcome everyone to statistical seminar. And today we are very, like it's our great pleasure to have it, St Stephen Walker from University of University of Texas at Austin to give us a presentation about Martingale posterior distributions. Stephen obtained his PhD in at Imperial College and supervised by John Web Wakefield, which who is also our faculty member. And then he joined, he, jo he has been in John several places in United uh, in Europe, like, including like Imperial College, Univers University of Bath and University of Kent. And then he joined the University of Texas at Austin in 2013. And Stephen has won numerous awards in both Europe and United States and has published more than 200 publications and has served in a list of like almost like all the important statistical journals as, as associate editors. So it was my great pleasure to introduce Stephen today. And today he's going to give us a very exciting talk. And Stephen. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, welcome. Uh, so this, uh, uh, the title Martingale Posterior Distributions, we put the paper recently up on uh, archive and that's um, indicated uh, at the bottom of this slide. And joint work with uh, Edwin Fong, who's actually, uh, he's at the Turing Institute, but I think he started life as a PhD student of Chris's at uh, Oxford. Uh, and, and this is also joint work with Chris as well. Um, okay, so um, another title by which I sometimes have given this talk is uh, Bayesian uncertainty, but it's the, the, the one I've used now is probably the better one. So it is about uncertainty as well. And um, so in a sense, in the first couple of slides, I'm just gonna sort of recap uh, what's understood by uncertainty, statistical uncertainty. Um, it's not any sense rigorous. So it's just going over the key points. So the idea that a finite sample is what's causing uncertainty when statistical decisions need to be made. The assumption being that if I had an infinite or arbitrary large sample, then decisions or unknowns become fully known. So on a, with a finite sample, um, and it, that leads to objects being unknown uh, with certainty. So the frequentists will deal with that notion through these, the notion of a sampling distribution. And at the heart of that is the idea, well, I saw this sample, uh, but I could equally well have seen a different sample. And hence the distribution of the statistic of interest in this case, X bar becomes um, the measure of the uncertainty. So um, point estimators, confidence intervals, tests, sort of pivot backwards, if you like, from, from this distribution. So it's acknowledging the idea that um, the quantity of interest, uh, the X bar, has, has actually got a distribution uh, based upon the mechanism of interest. Um, the Bayesian approaches that in a, in a obviously different way. Um, so the apparent source of or starting position uh, of uncertainty is the prior uh, gets updated to the posterior, but it, it doesn't seem apparent that there's any sense that the observations are, I, they're fixed. Uh, there's no notion that I could have seen a different sample than, a, the, than the one that's actually been seen. In a sense, the observations become uh, uh, fixed and the posterior uh, depends on those, obviously. Uh, but there's no notion of, I saw this sample, but I could equally well have seen a different one uh, leading to a different posterior distribution. So they do take on the idea of uncertainty in different ways. And you might argue that the Bayesian assessment appears arbitrary. I know that's sort of a, a sort of rough word in a sense, but the arbitrariness in the sense that, well, the prior um, is, is I, I don't want to say arbitrary, but it, it, you know, if you're going to be 
using things like improper priors and, and such like, or default choices of prior, then in some respects, it, it can be viewed in that way. So that, that then becomes an important issue for small samples. So, so the point of these two slides is just to try and get across the idea that the dealing of uncertainty, Bayes, Frequentis, appear quite different um, outlooks in, in terms of how they uh, proceed. So what I, I think now is the best thing is to forget what I've just said. And we look at things in a slightly different way. And the idea here is to try and is to think of uncertainty now as what's missing. So you might say, well, it's the same as saying the sample is of a finite sample. And that's true. But if you think of it in terms of, well, my uncertainty is being generated or being caused by what I'm not seeing, then one line of attack is to complete what's missing. So this is a bit of a loose uh, notation here. So I, and people have said, oh, well, such a density would have would be zero. What I mean by this notation of the conditional density is a sampling scheme. So at least there's a sampling scheme or I could write down an arbitrarily large sequence of density functions for which uh, I would be recovering an infinite or arbitrarily large uh, sample. So if I'm willing to construct such an object and then uh, at the end of it, the theta is fully known. So if I have access to this arbitrary large sample or let's just put infinity so I don't have to keep saying arbitrarily large, um, then I would be able to pin down exactly what theta I'm interested in. So if I put those to together, um, so if I'm willing to assess uncertainty by what's missing, I'm willing to construct some kind of mechanism, sampling mechanism or joint distribution for the missing observations. And then I'm willing to say that my parameter of interest is fully defined based upon that complete sample. The upshot is that I have a distribution for the theta infinity, which will be conditional on what I've seen, just on what I've seen the x1 to n. So you might say that has parallels with Bayesian inference at the moment, that's fine, but uh, I, I wouldn't make that jump to Bayes at this point. All I make clear here is that even though it looks like I'm now just taking that sample that I've seen as fixed and I'm not taking any uncertainty into account, well, in fact, if I'm looking at it from a missing sample perspective, what I have seen would always be a part of that infinite sample. It would always be there. So in that respect, it can be treated as uh, fixed in the sense that any arbitrary large sample would have that as part of it. So just this willingness to fill in the missing observations, I'm automatically going to get a distribution for my parameter of interest, which will be dependent on what I've seen and that uh, makes perfect sense. Um, so in order, if I'm going to proceed along this line, so I, I need a density estimator uh, for every n, not just necessarily at the um, sample size little n. Um, and the idea is to keep sampling into the future through these density functions. So as I said, I'll have one of these densities for no matter how large a sample size I've got. But the idea here is that I would always treat uh, samples, whether observed or generated in the same way. So I will always feed them back into the density estimator and then take uh, the next ones based on that. So treat future sampled observations in the same way as if they'd been seen. So that leads to a possible way of um, generating a joint density for the missing uh, observations. So an example, it's, uh, and as I said, the idea here is to forget Bayes. Don't 
try and make any connection with Bayes at this point at all, because it, there's nothing Bayesian happening on this slide. It's, this is a completely, um, it's just literally just treating uncertainty as being generated by the missing data, trying to fill it in, take my parameter of interest once I've simulated a large sample, and that gives me a distribution on the parameter of interest conditional on what I have seen. So uh, uh, if I have assume, I, I stood, let's just for simplicity assume the sigma is known, a density estimator for the normal mean problem that I mentioned earlier, I would have a normal distribution. So it makes sense centered on the sample mean that I've got and the known variance sigma squared. So if I then go through that sampling scheme, so even though I've just written that down for the sample size n, that's going to be valid no matter what sample size I've got, generated or actually seen. Um, so I generate a new observation, I recycle that back and get a new sample mean and I keep going. Um, the parameter, the equivalent of the x bar, now call it big N, I can write in this way where the Zs are independent. So the ZLs here are independent standard normals. Um, I take the limit. So theta infinity is the parameter of interest. That's the limit. And some fairly straightforward maths is that that theta infinity uh, condition now on what I have seen is normal. Its mean is the sample mean I did see. And the variance, give or take something very, very small, is sigma squared over n. Um, the convergence being guaranteed in some respects, although it's not just that, would be that, or as a point of interest, to note that the theta n is a, is a martingale. So as I said, there's nothing Bayesian on this slide at all, yet it remarkably looks like something that is Bayesian in the sense that um, I'm getting a distribution for the parameter of interest, which only depends on um, what I have seen. And it looks remarkably close to being a posterior distribution based upon uh, a, a prior, which could be regarded as non-informative. Um, but I don't want to go over the, say this again too many times, but um, in the past, um, people are already trying to find the connection with Bayes, but there is nothing Bayesian on this slide at all, although it is picking up something that looks remarkably similar to Bayes. Um, all it relies on is treating uncertainty as what's missing and being willing to generate um, distributions that sample the missing uh, bits. It also brings out the point that um, naturally, very naturally, the parameter of interest becomes a, a random object. That is, um, there's no hiding why uh, the parameter of interest is regarded as a random quantity. Uh, I put this slide here because it just makes the point that, okay, we're not restricted um, there's not really much restrictions to that normal example. So if I had something more general, a more general family of density functions, I would, for example, to mirror what I've just shown you, be using something like an MLE. I would be sampling, recycling, getting a new MLE, keep, keep going, maximizing, so for example, the log likelihood as you go along, limits existing, um, and again, you'd be able to get this uh, distribution uh, for the parameter of interest conditional on what you have seen. Um, the key components uh, being the distribution for which you generate your samples. So that's the density estimator at any sample size n, 
and how you want to construct your parameter of interest. So literally, you're, I mean, in a sense, this is now removing theta necessarily from the idea that it para, uh, is a parametric or parameterizes a family of density functions. It literally could be anything, but um, the key point is that we need limits to exist. So all of this is fine and good um, for the examples and the cases I've put up here. Uh, limits exist, there is, or, uh, so there's no problem in the de defining of these kind of quantities. But in more general problems, um, nothing, you, it's not a case of, oh, well, anything works here, we can do anything, uh, limits need to exist. Uh, and so that's, that's where the focus um, moves to. It's the idea that we need to con be able to construct these objects such that we can uh, guarantee limits existing. So before that, I just, um, again, from past experience of giving this talk, it's probably a good idea just to run through a, a summary of where I believe we've got to at this point. So the key is this uh, density estimator, if you like, nothing more, nothing less than a density estimator at each possible sample size n. So that's that's not any, you know, that's that's obviously something where you believe your observations are coming from. I mean, it's uh, it's, it's not arbitrary. The idea then is that that can lead you to generate the missing samples every time you take on a new sample that gets recycled back. Uh, so in a sense, your density estimator is increasing with a sample of size one. The key point being that whether you generated them or see or saw them, you treat them in, in the same way. Uh, so as long as that limit exists, that defines a distribution for the parameter of interest, um, conditional on the x1 to, to n. Um, and that is working basically, it's saying, well, my source of uncertainty is what's missing and I'm just going to take that head on and deal with it. And this is what you end up with. So obviously there is a connection with Bayes. There, there couldn't not be, um, and there is. So really the question is, okay, well, what does my density estimator at the top of this page have to be in order for me to recover Bayes? And the answer is a predictive. Um, so that would arise um, to be formal in some way, assume if you want to assume the whole sequence to be exchangeable, um, the, the idea of a, a prior uh, leading to a posterior, leading to a predictive. And you say, okay, well, are you just going around in circles? Well, no, not at all, not at all. If I take um, that, stop, that density at the top of this slide as a predictive based upon a prior and likelihood and a posterior, and then you say, okay, now I do this sampling scheme, um, what is the distribution for theta infinity? Well, the result, uh, in, in our opinion, it's not widely known, but the connection between the two is provided by Doob. So Doob's theorem didn't, um, he wasn't interested in Bayes, he was interested in Martingales, and his result wasn't really regarded in any context in which I'm now talking about it. It was some notion of consistency in the sense that the Bayesian sequence of posteriors under this perfect sampling scheme of uh, De Finetti uh, led to the posterior accumulating at a random point and the random point came from the prior. Um, so if we translate that into the context in which I'm talking and we start this off at the posterior rather than the prior, what it says, what Doob's result says is that there's two uh, procedures we can uh, implement and they both lead to the same thing. So I can start with a prior, I can uh, derive the posterior and I can sample from the posterior. That's option one. 
Option two says that I can construct my predict sequence of predictives uh, from that. I can keep sampling in the missing uh, observations. So that's the X1 to infinity. I can construct my theta infinity. So in this case, I'm going back and thinking about the normal mean problem again. And what Dube's results said is that theta infinity is distributed as the posterior. So strictly his result was that the posterior accumulates at a point mass and the point is distributed according to the um, posterior. So those two are the same and there's no circular argument here because what it's saying is that um, Bayes is really, if you want to now think of Bayes as option two rather than option one, uh, which I can now do, I can say, well, option one is a shortcut provided by do. Do says option one is a shortcut to option two. The idea being, okay, well, it's all uh, De Finetti constructed, but what option two says is that, well, why do I need to actually start with this thing that's been generated from a prior and a likelihood and a posterior. All option two is really saying is, well, I just need a density estimator. And in a sense, there's some very elegant tidying up going on with Bayes in the sense that all of this fits into one nice big bundle in the sense that prior likelihood, posterior, predictive and dupe, they all tie up. But if you view the world now according to option two, and the idea of treating uncertainty as being caused by what's missing, and you're trying to get a density estimator to fill in what's missing, suddenly that predictive becomes, or using the, a predictive becomes just one possible density estimator among many others. And you could probably think of many, many ways in which you can get a better density estimator than a predictive. Um, so the trick or the idea is to view the correct assessment of uncertainty as option two and to think of Bayes as option two, but with some special cases attached to it. And in a sense, that's the idea of um, the talk that let's move on from Bayes uh, regarding option two as the real um, idea lurking behind uh, a better assessment of uncertainty or the right or the Bayesian assessment of uncertainty and sort of throwing away the idea that the density estimator must be a predictor. So in a sense, this slide is just uh, repeating what I've just said. Um, your, your question might be, well, why would you now advocate option two? Well, uh, it might not sound like it or seem uh, at this point, but it's easy to implement. It's more general than traditional base and it uh, broadens the scope of the problem because theta can literally be any quantity of interest. Um, and in a set, and in a, as I've tried to argue, it's, it's it's really saying, well, Bayes at its heart is uh, about filling in the missing observations. It deals with uncertainty by doing that. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, and it's done through a, obviously a relaxation of the assumption of uh, exchangeability. Remember, we still need limits to exist. So limits exist here. Um, that's Dube's, obviously Dube's result. Um, uh, what we're moving on from as well is the idea that exchangeability starts after you've seen your sample of small n. So there are many procedures, Bayesian procedures, um, people call them pseudo Bayes or whatever. But again, the idea is the same. The idea is to construct a density estimator. Uh, if you want to make that depend upon a fully prepared posterior, um, which doesn't come from a prior, uh, we would say, well, no problem. Uh, 
again, the argument could be, well, why do you see that as the best density estimator? Um, maybe it is, uh, maybe there's better choices or other choices, but certainly this is something that Bayesians will be doing. Um, the idea, um, I think the name for them is data dependent posterior distributions. Uh, and they're basically the idea of going straight to constructing a posterior, usually such that it has particular properties, asymptotic properties, which are difficult to achieve if you start with a, a prior. So one such example that's fairly widely used is the Bayesian bootstrap. So that would be the idea that the posterior is a Dirichlet process with um, the scale sample size and Fn is the empirical. Um, in this uh, way, again, you wouldn't actually need to generate the whole missing data because you can work out what the distribution of the limit would be. In this case, it would be a distribution function. So what you can do is keep sampling observations from the predictive, recycle, get a different predictive. And at each, each time you did that, you'd get a random empirical distribution called the F infinity. But actually I don't need to do that because uh, the math tells us that I, all I need to do is have a weighted version of the empirical Fn. So the infin F infinity, I don't need to get through a sampling scheme. I, I can do the maths and just figure out what it is. Uh, and it's literally, it's just a weighted empirical distribution function in that case. Um, so what our, our aim was to actually remove, relax that, uh, uh, exchangeable assumption as well, as in going from the sample size you did see and assuming exchangeability from there on. Um, uh, and the idea is to base it on martingales. So to, to build up a sequence of predictives which uh, form a martingale sequence. And the reason why you'd want to do that is fairly obvious. The idea is that you wouldn't want this sequence of random distribution functions to start meandering all over the place. You'd want the expected random distribution functions sitting at the end of a, an infinite sampling scheme to have a centering on the distribution function that you did actually see. I mean, that would make sense. Uh, it, it wouldn't make sense to not have that. Um, and hence, martingales become a key property of the sequence of uh, density estimators to, to make the distributions form a martingale sequence. So that str is strongly connected with this notion of conditionally identically distributed sequences, which has been something that uh, Pietro Rigo and uh, a number of his co-authors have been working on. So the definition of a CID sequence is that um, the marginal distribution of uh, a, an observation X at big N, given um, the sample that I have seen, is the same. And it's the distribution, the first uh, distribution P little n, uh, for all large n bigger than the small n. Okay, so that's the definition of CID that's satisfied, for example, if we have a martingale uh, sequence. So in a sense, the upshot uh, after all of this is that uh, in, in some very short summary, uh, the exchangeable assumption is being exchanged for a CID sequence. It's uh, it, it's a minimal assumption. It, so if, in, in one respect, it's saying, well, it's, almost, it's a minimal assumption for what we require, limits to exist and for them, the means to be uh, equal to our original density estimator based on what we did see. Um, and in another respect, exchangeability is more than you need. In, in a sense, exchangeability is providing you with some notion of elegance and coherence, which you might say, well, I, it's fancy, but do I actually need it for all these things to exist? If I'm just taking the uncertainty head on by sampling what's missing, 
the minimal I need. What I what I do need is a CIG sequence. Uh, exchangeability is often a lot more is more than what you actually do need. Um, so our obligation now is to find uh, a sequence of uh, predictive uh, distributions which form a martingale sequence and for which the samples will be CID. And a very general sequence um, is provided by what I have up the top here. Um, so this tells me how I get to PN plus one. If, so if I have, so think of N now, little N now, not as necessarily the sample size, but as moving forward over all samples. So I get the PN plus one by mixing this uh, with a, a weight and that the properties of the weight are below. Um, a mixture of the original uh, or the dense, the distribution at N and this other term, which uh, is based on a copula. So strictly it's a conditional copula. Um, it, we actually take it to be a, uh, based on a Gaussian copula with a particular correlation. And uh, for given what we all know about copulas, if you integrate copulas, uh, they nicely, even if you've got an one of the arguments is not one, if you integrate with respect to the other, you get, uh, well, if you're doing it for the copular density, you get one. If you're doing it for this copular distribution, uh, you'll get exactly uh, what's sitting uh, in the U argument position. So that will be the PNX. So if I integrate now over the XN, remember XN has the distribution PN. So if I now integrate out the XN, that part is equivalent to integrating out the V, the conditional part, and I just get left with the U because um, it's the distribution part. So I'll get left with the U, which is the P and X. So that will just cancel, the WN will now disappear and I'll just get left with the P and X. So this forms a martingale uh, sequence. Um, so that's, um, that this slide here is just basically um, showing what I've just pointed out uh, about the property of um, uh, of the martingale. Uh, sorry, of the uh, copula. So the distribution. Uh, so the the sequence of PNs will form a martingale, and the samples will form a CID sequence. And we. Uh, the basic, the limit theorems are fairly elementary and we will have convergence to a random distribution function, uh, P infinity. So we, we do acknowledge that people like Pietro Rigo have done a lot of work on, on those sequences. Um, but uh, from, uh, he would not deny that he came at all of this from a probabilistic perspective, uh, looking for properties uh, of such sequences. Um, so all I make at this point is that um, the, uh, as I've said all along, I guess, to some extent, the thetas are not necessarily have to be, uh, they can be connected up to more general types of loss function. So the idea of um, uh, the theta being index, indexing a parametric family would be that the L theta X at the bottom equation would be your um, minus log density, um, what's appearing at the top. Uh, there's no obligation for that to be the case here. Um, I shouldn't really have put theta infinity because it's mixing things up. The theta infinity is a random object. So all we'd be doing is starting our procedure off um, sampling and then taking the random theta infinity in the limit, um, the minimizer of the limiting uh, procedure. Uh, Stephen, uh, there yeah. was a question by, by, by raised by an audience, uh, Alan. Says the, uh, the question is what's a copula and can you explain the motivation behind choosing that a little bit more? Yeah, so, uh, so the first part was what is a copula? Is that correct? Right, right. Yeah, that's the first. Okay, part. so a, a copula 
density would just be a density function on zero, one squared, where the marginals are uniform. Um, so if I integrate, for example, if I integrate then a copula density with respect to one of the arguments, I'm always, no matter what the argument, other argument is, I'm always going to get one. So if I take the conditional distribution function, which is the H I've got here. So if you now think about taking the conditional distribution of one of the arguments conditional on the other, so that's effectively also uh, when you do a conditioning, there's nothing to condition on, it's just one, right? Because the marginal is just one. If I now integrate, so if I take that HUV and I integrate out with respect to V, I get U, I'll get U. So the integral, and I think it's on the second part here, it's a bit more hidden because I put in the distribution functions, but if I, so if I, that HUV there, if I integrate that with respect to V, I'm going to get U. So if you look at the equation above that and recall the Xn is coming from the Pn, if I now uh, do the integration, the conditional integration to, to see what the Pn plus one, the conditional uh, expectation of it is to see if I have a martingale, uh, I'd be interested in this integral here and I only need now to do a transformation V is Pn of Z and the Jacobian is Pn, the density Pn Z. So that just, when I integrate that out, I'm just gonna get Pn X. And then the WNs disappear and I still just get Pn X. So I have a martingale. Um, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, I think that's, that answered that question. Thanks. Yeah. So the, so the upshot is that that sequence at the top here forms a martingale sequence of distribution functions, and hence limits exist. And hence, OK, there's some maths to be done. Um, oops, sorry. Um, where was I? Yeah, OK. So, so the, one of the things that I worked with Chris a lot in the past is this idea of, so uh, frequentists have no issue at all in minimizing these kind of loss functions and uh, estimating parameters that minimize these kind of things and doing uh, properties of estimators and things like that. The trouble that Bayesians have always had is that if you're going to start with a prior, you've got a calibration issue because you've got to somehow connect up that loss function with something that's connected to the prior. And then you've got a problem calibrating prior information with data information. And it is a bit of a headache. The nice thing about all of this is that um, it, it's based, but prior free Bayes in the sense that if you acknowledge or are willing to view now Bayes as just filling in what's missing and not necessarily having to start with a predictive which starts with a prior and say well that really is not necessary for dealing with some uncertainty in this way so if you say well I'm, re I'm really about dealing with uncertainty in this way and I really don't feel I need to start this off with uh, a prior likelihood posterior predictive uh, that's completely unnecessary, then that argument has, uh, the calibration disappears because there's no prior. And in a sense, this is an alternative mechanism to dealing with the same problem that frequentists can deal with, but in the complete opposite way of treating uncer the uncertainty is coming from what's missing rather than I saw this data, but I could have seen that one. It's, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit dark in here. Um, it's, uh, it's the idea again of a density estimator, sample the missing data, taking the limit and uh, um, obtaining the minimum in the limit and repeating and you build up the sample uh, conditional on what you actually did see. So that's what we 
liked about this um, idea um, that we can now match uh, everything that classical statistics, frequentist statistics can do, but in a fundamentally different way of how uncertainty is taken on directly. So one takes it on by saying, I saw this, but I could have seen this. The other says, well, actually, uh, I saw what I saw, and it's a part, and it will always be a part of uh, an infinite sample, which I'm just going to generate and fill in and get my random parameter from the limits. So I think I just have a bit of time just to do a more some more substantial uh, illustrations. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of illustrations in the paper, and they do go into quite deep um, problems. Um, if you think about it, if you're only having to sample missing future observations, and you basically just need to start off with some kind of density estimator. You can do this whether you're doing regression, hierarchical modeling. So we do a lot of different scenarios. Um, uh, but the key ideas are that we're, we're always working under some principle of martingales um, to construct the future uh, sequence of distributions. So this is just a bit more substantial than the normal example I've been talking about in that the variance is unknown. So it's not a big deal, but it still makes the point that uh, we would be um, updating as we go into the future, both the mean and the variance. Um, so the predictive, sorry. Well, I mean, that that's, I mean, I think here we're actually doing, we're comparing with a Bayesian. Um, so this example is, is doing it, but it's doing it from a, a Bayesian way, it's actually got a Bayesian predictive to do all of the sampling. Uh, so in, in a sense, this one is just showing the do idea. This is, so this illustration is just getting across the do idea. So all of those parallel runs on the left are the sequences. Um, so after a thousand, I mean, I wouldn't need to push this to a thousand, but if you push it to a thousand and then just take the theta infinity effectively uh, and then put them into the right figure, um, one of those is the correct posterior and the other one is just a dense, a, a smooth version of those theta infinity samples that we got from the left sequence. So this is nothing more than a, um, uh, the illustration of Dube's result, this two option idea of how you do it. But as I said before, the, the key idea for the talk is that we are not accepting that the starting density estimator need be a fully formed predictive uh, density. Um, uh, non, uh, galaxy data set, um, because it's one I know how to uh, work with. Um, so uh, we actually generate the starting density using, um, so if you remember the sequence of distributions that we um, did, I just need a starting distribution to and to be fair, I'm not exactly recalling what that starting distribution was that we used here. Um, uh, I think this in, 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 in what's coming up, I think I used um, uh, um, the actual copular idea starting from the first sample, but it's also possible to use something like a kernel density estimator. I mean, literally anything you'd, 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 you'd want uh, to use. Um, for us, there's no, uh, there's no restrictions on that side. So what's going on here is uh, on the left is um, using the martingale sequence. So it's the martingale posterior in action. So um, 
it, the thing to look at here are the gray shadows because they form the uncertainty bounds, if you like, for the random density functions that we were picking off on, on as we sample forward. These are going to be the um, uncertainty bands for the density functions we pick off. And they look eminently reasonable. Uh, on the right are the ones, uh, uh, what you'd get using standard Dirichlet process mixture modeling. So it, there isn't a whole lot of difference. Um, we're gonna get some differences because uh, that's the very nature of what's going on here. Um, so this, um, I don't know, I mean, it's just an illustration of uh, what you can get. And if you say, well, surely all those parallel runs take a lot longer. Um, no, the figure on the left is almost in instantaneous using parallel sampling. And uh, basically forward sampling from predictives, which are easy to sample from. Um, so if I scroll, if I were to scroll all the way back and you'd say, okay, well, you've got these copular, these PN plus ones, how do you sample them? They're actually very straightforward to sample. They do not actually, I should have mentioned it at the time, but they're actually very easy to sample. So that sequence of that picture with the uncertainty on the left is a matter of, well, instantaneous, I'd say, and the one, on the right, so anyone who works on Bayes non-parametrics, we will know that that's a grueling procedure to try and knock these things out. Uh, you've got to get your tuned uh, MCMC and uh, Dirichlet process algorithm, uh, and it's not a straightforward uh, proposition. It's, it's complicated and takes time. Uh, so not only, so that, that was one of the arguments I gave earlier about why uh, option two becomes very attractive in that it's very, very quick um, to get to get these things. Even um, sorry, I, I don't, I be, every time I give this talk, I've been meaning to get rid of that slide. So the best thing is just to uh, ignore it. Um, so uh, summary. Um, so as I've said probably a thousand times already, um, but there's one more won't hurt. Um, we view Bayes uh, or an extension of Bayes or, or the principle, the fundamentals of Bayes as uh, treating uncertainty as by what's missing and attacking that directly by setting up a sequence of distributions or a sampling scheme for filling in those what's missing. And then as long as limits exist, picking off the parameter of interest or from that infinite or arbitrarily large uh, sample. The nice thing is that if you want to see Bayes in that way and you want to teach Bayes, you're no longer faced with the awkwardness of why is your parameter a random variable and no one else treats it as such. Um, I always found it a different, difficult argument. Say, so, well, it's random because I need to translate my information into a density and therefore suddenly my parameter is a random object. Whereas here it's natural. It's the most natural thing for the parameter now to be the random object because you're filling in the, ran um, the randomness arises naturally because you're filling in the miss uh, what's missing. Um, it's the most perfectly natural thing, which makes you more uh, happy to accept the idea that this is a, a realistic way of dealing with uncertainty um, through what is missing and filling in. Um. So the special case uh, is that the density estimator coincides with a properly or proper Bayes constructed predictive for which the prior exists. But in that case, you don't need to go through option two, you just sample the posterior because it's the same. You have a shortcut if you like. Um, and to put it uh, uh, in a box, if you like, uh, exchangeability is getting relaxed. So once you view 
the idea is filling in the missing samples and it's then a case of relaxing the assumption of exchangeability by which you would be using a prior because that's what Dafinetti says exists. Uh, that's more than you need for limits to exist. And in a sense, the exchangeability is being relaxed to conditionally identically distributed sequences uh, via the Martingales. And as I mentioned, uh, the paper we've put on archive contains many, many different types of data structures and models, and they can all be dealt with in a very uh, similar way. And on that point, I will uh, finish there. Thanks very much um, for listening. And any questions? Okay, thanks, Stephen. And there's a question from Richard. So Richard is asking, is recycling the next sample essential to the second option? What happens if you do not recycle? So yeah, that's, I'm not gonna scroll all the way back. I, uh, um, so if you don't, um, and I actually did have a slide at some point which explained why you do the recycling. So the recycling aspect of it is the idea that you should be treating an observation whether you filled it in or whether it was real in the same way, okay? So that would be a uh, motivation. If you didn't do that and just sampled an infinite sequence from your density, well, that's all you're gonna get, right? The, the limit will be the same every single time, right? You're gonna get the sample mean. So if you take that normal example I did and just do that, all you're gonna get in the limit is the same sample mean that you observed. Right? There's no random distribution going on. I mean, that's just the law of large numbers, right? Um, so the recycling is the bit that gives you the randomness in the limit. And then you say, well, that's artificial. But then I'd say, well, but that's Bayes. <laughs> I mean, that is Bayes. That's what you do. That's what dude says you do, right? That is the dude point. Um, so if you Again, if you just do the sampling from the density, uh, you get a sample size n. In a sense, you're being a frequentist because you're just doing uh, lots of bootstraps. Uh, they're bootstraps, right? You're getting a, another sample of size little n, and then you're going to get another one of little n. It's like the parametric bootstrap of Ephron, right? You just plug in an MLE and generate another sample of size n. So what you're doing is just generating a lot of samples uh, of Ephron type bootstrap samples of size N and just putting them one after the other. Whereas the whole point of the Bayesian idea is that you recycle, right? So in a sense, that's another fundamental difference between the two. One who's saying, well, I saw this data set, but I could equally well have seen another, will just sample from the density estimator because they just want to keep sampling uh, other alternatives to what they did see. But the Bayesian says, no, I'm missing, but I'm going to treat what I see in the same way as what I did with the actual ones I have got. And that leads to this notion of at the end of each parallel run, you've got a random quantity of interest. And hence, you have a very naturally arising posterior distribution. Um, Thanks, Stephen. And I think there's also another question from Alan. And Alan is asking, can you comment on how the estimate of theta affects your posterior distribution of theta? For instance, in the, first, uh, in the very first normal example, what would happen if I choose an estimate of the mean just as like x1 rather than x bar? And are there conditions for how you must specify the, the PXM plus one condition like X1 to M for this approach to work? So, so I would say that you need an honest density estimator, right? I mean, if you're gonna take a, a bad density estimator, one that you'd know was bad, um, you, you'll get a posterior distribution, but it will be like, I guess, a Bayesian picking a prior, which is ridiculous, I guess. I mean, you, you, everybody can generate a bad posterior distribution, right? 
but we assume we're all being honest and trying to do the best we can. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, density estimate, if you say, oh, well, I could pick this density estimate or I could pick that density estimate, oh, yeah, but you already can. <laughs> I mean, you can take a non-parametric density estimate, you can take it to be a histogram, you can take it to be a KDE, you can take it to be this, that, or the other, a mixture model. So we all can do that in a way. We all have that option of taking any density estimator. We care. So it's not like saying, well, oh, but if you, get, if you choose a different density estimator, you get a different answer. Yes, if you use a different density estimator, everybody gets a different answer. Yeah. So if you base your density estimator on less than all the observations you've seen, um, you wouldn't expect anybody to do that. Okay? So that would be the answer. We wouldn't do that just as and nobody would. Right? Thanks, Stephen. And well, there are a lot, a lot of questions. So another question is about, in the fir first, uh, uh, from Hongxiang, uh, at the first glance, these methods seem to be similar to, uh, these methods seem to be able to achieve something similar to the fiducial statistics. And both can provide distributional conclusion on parameters without prior. And can you comment on how they might have different implications? So I see them as completely different in the sense that fiducial doesn't take on any notion of um, the uncertainty in the way that we started this off. Yeah. So I'm saying, I'm gonna take my starting point to be this and only this, what's missing, right? That's what's causing my uncertainty and I'm gonna start tackling that problem and to see where you go with it. Well, if you're gonna tackle it directly um, and you still wanna know things, you know, you, you might say, well, is it obvious that you fill in the missing? Well, in a way, yes, because you'd say, well, I only really need to, I only know what this theta is when I've got an infinite sample, right? So you might question whether treating the missing observations leads to you having a density estimator and then filling in the missing data, whether that strictly follows. I claim it does. I claim there's no, no other way you can take that on. And it is exactly what Bayesians are doing, but it's sort of buried in the idea that it's not explicit. It doesn't appear explicitly because of the shortcut of the posterior, right? Um, so, so I, th I see they go naturally together, whereas I don't see fiducial arising as a problem, as a solution to a problem of thinking about uncertainty in a direct way. Um, that probably is opinion to some extent, but um, so in a way it's sort of acknowledging two real sources of information and hence two real ways of dealing with it, which we know as Bayesian frequentist, although we're just about to try and relax the Bayesian version of it, which is that you can either treat uncertainty as a, the finiteness of the sample and one of possible many samples you saw, or you, you go ahead and fill in what's missing. And there's not much else. I don't know any other way you could think of dealing with it. Thanks, Stephen. And I think Thomas also have rest, uh, some, uh, rest his hands. I, I will just allow Thomas to ask directly. Yeah, sorry. So the question here is a little vague, and I thought it'd be easier to ask it uh, in person. So there's a literature um, due to Bruce Hill, uh, who was at University of Michigan, um, where he said, which, which sort of it seems similar to this in a certain way, where he it was a non parametric Bayes approach where. Is that the AN? The AN, is that the yes, AN? Yes, AN, yes. So yeah. could, you, could you say something? I, I mean, I, I'm just, I remember that it was a little strange because it has to be finitely additive or something, but can you, can you just tie that in a little bit? To, yeah, to he, had, he had a problem in the tail, so if I remember. Yeah, yes. because he, I mean, he, he had unbounded support. Yeah. But he, he, also, he, also, he also motivated Zip's law and other things with it. Yeah, so if I remember as well, he was trying to, I mean, I think in those days, there was still that 
necessity of convincing everybody, hey, look, it's really Bayes. It's just a small walk from Bayes. It's Bayes or something like that. Whereas, um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't think it stood the test of time to some extent. And I think he had the trouble with the tales and it was parametric. About more about it, I'm probably not able to say in terms of the details of what what um, what further about it. But I don't think he saw, I don't remember anything I did read about it, about, again, uncertainty being a, an aspect. So if you're saying, can we take out density estimator as his AN sequence, I would say we, have, we would have trouble in the tails, right? But can you explain it? Because basically my memory of this is essentially, he just said, you've got your first N observations and then he wants, yeah, to, so, he wants so to have he, a distribution that makes it equally likely that you're in any one of the intervals that's yeah, that's given right. by those. That's right. So it was on the one, the one over N plus one intervals uh, created by the data. And, and, and I think, I think, the, the, yeah. sorry, sorry to bite him. The subtlety was just that it has to be finitely additive. You have to do finitely additive days. That's my vague memory. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you, you, I, I do remember going through it at the time, but uh, I wouldn't be able to say much about it at this point, but I, I wouldn't think, I think we would have, so I don't think there's a connection. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe at this point that there is a connection, a formal connection that we could make. Um, if we took his sequence, I don't believe, I don't know if they create a Martingale sequence. They may do. Uh, they may, limits probably exist. So maybe it's possible. Maybe thanks. Maybe it's something we can look at. I can look at and see exactly what kind of sequence he's generating there. Uh, my guess uh, is that you probably wouldn't get uh, something much different to what you do. You get if you did a Bayesian bootstrap, for example. Um, Great. Thanks. Yeah. That's oh, nice. So I have to think about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. And and Nick has another question. Uh, is this method computationally tractable or estimating lots of param? Uh, oh, is this method computationally tractable for estimating lots of parameters? Um. I don't know what lots mean these days. Some people talk about billions, but some just talk about over a hundred or something. I mean, we're we're moving it on, I guess, is 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 the thing. So we're move we're moving this forward in the sense that um, so we would still claim that if you're gonna do proper base, uh we would be able to do it more easily using uh, our approach. Yeah, we would. So if you just said, okay, um, you've got this, be a Bayesian, you've got this, do it your way. We would claim now that we can always do it more simply. Yeah. So in terms of uh, dimension, I guess Bayesian gets restricted in some way as well as to the dimension. Mm. Thanks. And, and there's a question coming from the, uh, an attendee. And the idea of parameter of interest being fully defined by the infinite amount of data in the population reminds me of a finite population inference in survey sampling. Do you think if there's any parallel between the, these two frameworks? Sorry, I didn't quite. So the, the mentioned finite sample, finite sample, a finite population, is that right? Did, right. Did that think, work? Yeah, finite. Pap uh, I think, yeah, like. Uh, the problem of interest was defined by the infinity amount of data, right? infinite sequence. But then in reality, we have the finite sample. And uh, yeah. you know, it's, like, it's, this, it's like a parallel to this survey sampling idea. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, you obviously don't, can't, I mean, you stop once you've converged, right? So when, once you realize your, your sequence is not moving, it's basically converged, you stop, I mean, if you say, how do you know? Well, you're tracking it, right? <laughs> so you might, I mean, I, I don't want to make this parallel, but you could, you know, when do you stop your MCMC, right? Okay, well, 
when do you stop your martingale sequence and say it's converged? Um, uh, if you can track it, you know, and the thing is, if you're doing it in parallel and you look at that picture I showed you, uh, that's, to me, that's fairly convincing, yeah? I mean, I'd know when to stop. I mean, somebody might say, oh, but one of those, they could all, they can't all start going off awry at, at this point, right? That's just not gonna happen, right? So you can track these and you can see. So yeah, we obviously have to terminate each of these sequences. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the practicalities of implementing statistics, right? You can't, um, you can't run things to infinity. And, okay, great, thanks. And there's another question from Richard. And so what are the conditions that makes a predictive rule to coincide with the ones that arises from a prior and a likelihood? So that would be when you take the density estimator as a fully uh, worked out predict Bayesian predictive, prior, proper prior, likelihood, posterior, predictive. So when that's your starting density estimator, what we do, if we, we don't use the we don't use the um, copula version anymore, but you know, Doob showed that that is still a Martin. I mean, that was Doob's paper. He showed that's a martingale, right? The Bayesian sequence of recycling. His interest was, hey, that's a martingale, and there's limit theorems, and hey, Bayesians then took that as an asymptotic justification of Bayes, right? Oh, well, it all works. Um, but we've put a slightly different perspective on that result. Um, so yes, it, it's not necessary to have that copula model to get a martingale, um, but it's a very nice one. It, it works. We can manipulate it to do multivariate and regression and time series and other scenarios as well. Um, but if you use the Bayes, fully Bayesian approach, uh, Dube's point was, well, that's still a martingale of sequence of predictive distributions with the sampling and the recycling. Yeah. Thanks. And I think uh, there's another question from Nick. And the next question is, uh, is there any, any connections to the empirical base? Uh, not, not, re not really, I don't think. I mean, empirical base, you might then say that the posterior is not really driven by the prior procedure, you'd have a data more of the data dependent posterior where your exchangeable assumption starts from little n plus one onwards, right? You're, you're not really operating on exchangeability for the first, for the sample you did see, but you're starting the exchangeability from the n plus one sample, right? So that would be what I would regard as a data dependent exchangeable sequence rather than the prior uh, exchangeable sequence, yeah. Okay, thanks, Steve. And the last question is from uh, Professor Ken Rice. And so Ken Rice, uh, Professor, Professor Ken Rice's question is that, and are there connections, like uh, are there connections between viewing the observer as a reflection, like as a ref reflecting the unseen data in the service and the service sample perspective. Well, in a service sample, like in the design based inference problem, then we generally are trying to estimate any statistic of interest or point of interest that would be that, that would be in the case that if you have in, if you have the entire population, then we could, that would define the point of interest in the service sample perspective. So do you think that would be do you think this idea will also have like the similar strengths as as, as what you uh, what you was do like what, what your method was I get trying to do? Um, so the intricacies of survey sampling, I'm not too familiar with, but... Um, so uh, I think the, the question is like uh, more, uh, maybe, okay, let me 
So, so I mean, all I would say is um, uh, the, the face value of what I've described is literally there's no hidden, there's nothing hidden, right? There's no concealment of anything. So what I've talked about is, is, is just that. So it would be, I guess, more for people to say, oh, I think what I'm doing ties in with this than us to say, oh, well, we think this applies to you, 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 and you. Um, or your uh, th th that that ideas. So the recycling bit, the recycling bit. I guess I wouldn't. I I don't. I've not seen. I've not seen that as a strategy. I, don't, I haven't seen that. Right. I don't. I haven't seen that anywhere beyond uh, before what we've done. It's been hidden in Bayes. It's there in Bayes, but it's been hidden. It's been hidden because you could just sample the posterior, so you never see it. Um, but beyond outside Bayes, I've never seen that idea of the sampling strategy and you recycle. And because why? Well, because there's CID sequences and the expert on those sequences is Pietro Rigo and he's own, only ever worked on it. And the only work he knows about it are based on probability, probabilistic properties of such sequences rather than statistical inference about un unknown parameters induced by uncertainty. I hope that sort of answers the question, but I'm not sure. Thanks. And yeah, um, um, Professor Cameron, you can also ask if you yeah. uh, no, th thanks, Stephen. Um, that and your earlier comment on, on survey stuff were, were, were helpful. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions for Stephen, Professor Stephen Walker? Okay, if no other question, then thanks Professor Stephen Walker again and, and everyone have a nice weekend and thank you again for this very, very exciting talk. Thank you very much and thanks everybody for, for being present. Thanks.